In 1974, the V&A's exhibition, Destruction of the Country House, mentioned more than 600 properties demolished in the last 100 years. This was due to the declining country house way of life that had become unsustainable, particularly from the outbreak of World War I. Today, some are still owned by the aristocracy, but now open to the public, providing an income that saves them for posterity. Many others are protected by the National Trust, funded by subscriptions and donations. They form part of a thriving industry for those enraptured with our past and way of life from the 17th century to the Edwardian period and finally two world wars that transformed the social structure. Many properties have been rescued by English Heritage and the National Trust. They come in all shapes and sizes and reflect different periods of architecture. One of the most grandiose, owned by the National Trust, is Waddesdon Manor, overlooking the Vale of Aylesbury. Built in 1874-9 to a design that, with its many towers and spires, it would equally be at home in France. When James de Rothschild died in 1957, he bequeathed the entire estate to the National Trust. For photographers, the main issue is to get a good shot without too many people, who are also probably taking photographs themselves. By comparison, Polston Lacey is modest in scale, but the Regency Villa built in the 1820s was noted for lavish weekend parties, hosted by Mrs. Ronald Greville, whose guests included royalty. Elizabeth Bowes Lyons and the future King George VI spent part of their honeymoon at Polston Lacey. Overlooking a deep valley, the house is situated on the edge of the North Downs, near Great Bookham, an idyllic scene, and there are numerous walks. My favourite is to stroll across the valley to the opposite hillside and then photograph the retrospect view back to the house. The primary purpose of the Trust's existence for the first 40 years was to protect the countryside. Its first property to be saved from demolition was Alfriston Clergy House. It was built around 1350 and purchased in 1896 for £10. Today, its properties span almost 1,000 years, Corfe Castle in Dorset being one of the oldest, built by William the Conqueror. Many of our great houses, such as Ickworth and Kettleston, were built during the 18th and 19th centuries. Item Moat and Little Morton Hall were constructed several centuries earlier. I photographed Item Moat in 2013 with an early pen camera, Little Morton Hall much later with an EM1, and the improvements in technical quality between the two shoots are quite clear. Little Morton Hall in Cheshire must rank as one of the most fascinating and unusual half-timbered buildings. It was constructed piecemeal over several centuries and looks disturbingly unbalanced. Already in Tudor times they were constructing buildings that are top-heavy, long before some of the amazing buildings now in modern London. At the other end of the time cycle, from the Victorian era, are Standen and Huendon. Disraeli was a favourite Prime Minister of Queen Victoria, who paid several visits to his Huendon estate in Buckinghamshire, near High Wycombe. Disraeli acquired Huendon in 1848 and set to work changing the original house, giving it a fashionable Gothic flavour, which Pevsner, the architectural historian, described as excruciating. After his death, not everything remained as Disraeli left it, but some of the decorative schemes are authentic, especially 
the rich interiors. Huendon also had a vital secret role in the Second World War and was used to produce maps for nighttime bombing missions, including the Dam Busters Raid. Standon near East Grinstead is unusual, more of a statement than stately. Built for a solicitor in 1892-4 by extending older farm buildings to a design by Philip Webb, it was influenced by the arts and crafts movement. It is noted for its William Morris wallpapers, fabrics and tiles, materials we might associate with more grandiose residences. The steep south-facing garden enjoys uninterrupted views to Ashdown Forest, but the reservoir came later in 1952. The architect at Standon was a friend of William Morris, but the only house that he built embodying many of his ideas about art and life is Red House. Bexley Heath was in the Kentish country, not so today. It has lost its rural atmosphere in favour of later housing due to the urban spread in southeast London. Much of the original furnishing has gone, but the building survives largely untouched. The use of a tripod inside National Trust properties is not permitted, therefore these shots, all of them, are hand-held. I trust that their sharpness stands as testimony to the excellence of the image stabilizers in both Olympus cameras and Zuiko lenses. Because of long shutter speeds, there might be a bit of noise. This can be corrected in Lightroom, but it adds a touch of atmosphere. Anyway, the alternative are burnt-out highlights, and they look really horrid. Not exactly homely, more a grand palace. Soon after the house was finished in 1765, visitors were given a tour by the housekeeper, Mrs. Garnet. The house in question was Kettleston Hall in Derbyshire, built for Sir Nathaniel Curzon, later the first Lord Scarsdale, to house his art collection. Today, of course, you are welcomed by National Trust volunteers, but whatever the reason for a visit, the house was built to impress from the moment you entered the marble hall with its ten alabaster columns on both sides before moving into the saloon, its dome rising to 62 feet. Both are the inspiration of Robert Adam. At grandiose and flamboyant Ickworth, it is the rotunda that immediately grabs the eye and senses. Located a few miles from Bury St Edmunds, it was built for Frederick Augustus Harvey, 4th Earl of Bristol, a controversial figure whose desire was to bring together his passion for art and Italy from his grand tour. Unfortunately, he died before completion, but his son oversaw its conclusion and bought pictures to hang in it. The National Trust acquired the property in 1956, but the East Wing is a luxury hotel. The National Trust's finest collection of pictures are at Petworth House in West Sussex. Indeed, it is a house of art. The whole area is imbued by the presence of Turner and Capability Brown, who landscaped the adjoining park. Due to their size, both house and park have the effect of almost elbowing the town to one side, which the motorists will soon discover when negotiating the twisty, narrow streets hemmed in by the soaring high walls of the estate. The Earl of Egremont recognised Turner's talents and had the foresight to invite him to Petworth on several occasions. He even had his own studio. Although the great storm of 1987 brought down many trees, the park today is very much as Turner painted it and conceived by Capability Brown. 
The Grand Stairs is perhaps the most jaw-dropping part of the house. It is crowned by gigantic murals, completed in 1720, telling a classical story that shows Prometheus stealing fire from the gods, alluding to the disastrous fire of 1714. The vogue for the aristocracy to build big country mansions, sometimes sweeping away whole villages, became the fashion during the 17th century. When travelling, now helped by better roads, there was a desire to bring the countryside to the doorstep of the mansion as a garden of Eden by recreating landscapes seen on the Grand Tour. A landscape gardener was employed of whom Lancelot Capability Brown is the best known, but not the first. Popular was the Haha, a sunken wall where the view from the house merged imperceptibly into the wild garden or countryside, the unseen wall preventing animals from straying into the pleasure grounds. Another idea to entertain and intrigue visitors was the ruined castle or folly, strategically positioned on a hilltop in view from the house and accessed by an avenue or path. At Wimpole Hall, north of Royston, Capability Brown added a three-towered Gothic ruin in 1774, framed by trees when viewed over the Serpentine Lake. Both the interior and exterior of the house is the work of several architects, designers and landscapers that included James Gibbs, Charles Bridgman and Humphrey Repton. Capability Brown's first completed landscape was at Croom in Worcestershire for the 6th Earl of Coventry, which launched his career. Sadly, it went through a period of neglect, but in 1996 the National Trust acquired the estate. Much work was necessary. It became one of their largest repair projects. The house is not much more than a shell, and the landscape garden still partly overgrown. It is open to the public, and although restoration is still in progress, much can be seen and enjoyed in its final state. It is projects like this that remind us of their importance today. These large grand estates are now places for our recreation that used to be the exclusive preserve of the nobility, but now saved for the nation and enjoyed by everyone.